Hey folks, and welcome to Typology, the show on which we explore the story of you through the lens of the Enneagram. My name is Anthony Skinner, producer of the show. We're thrilled to have you here with us today, folks. We've got a great guest. Before I get to our guest, and let me remind you, if you don't already know, Ian dropped his brand new book, The Story of You, and it is available everywhere fine books are sold, as well as the audio version, and Ian reads it himself. So be sure and grab a copy if you haven't already. Today's guest is a licensed professional counselor, writer, and speaker. She hails from Castle Rock, Colorado. She specializes in trauma and body-centered therapies. I'm talking about Andy Kolber, and she has been featured on Relevant, CT Women, The Huffington Post, The Mud Room, Happy Sunship, and Circling the Story. We delve into trauma and body-centered therapies today, so I know you'll enjoy this episode. That's it for me, Anthony Skinner. And now, without any further ado, here is the host of our show, Ian Crump. Andy Kolber, author of the wonderful new book, Try Softer, a fresh approach to move us out of anxiety, stress, and survival mode and into a life of connection and joy. <gasps> Welcome to Typology, you four with a self-preservation <laughs> four with a three wing. It's good to be here. Good to be here. Good to see you. All right. We have so much to talk about, but we are going to start maybe even touching, you know, on what we uh, were mentioning before we started hitting record. You took a while to figure out that you were an Enneagram 4 because you are the counter type, the self-pressed 4, right? <laughs> and um, I want to hear more about that journey of self-discovery. Yeah. Um, well, it's really been a, a helpful tool. And I was um, saying to you, actually, your podcast has been really helpful for me just to hear different people's experience of their numbers. And even, you know, you talk about yourself and um, you just I've been a therapist for like 15 years, um, but the Enneagram wasn't something I, I learned, you know, in that work. And so as I was trying to integrate what I already knew with the Enneagram, at first, I, you know, we had some folks who um, actually, I, I think I've heard this is something you're not supposed to do, but they basically kind of told me I was a one. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, and I could see, I could see some of that. Um, but it didn't, because I do, um, especially I think because I'm a survivor of complex trauma from my childhood. And part of how I coped with that was, was by developing some rigidity in some areas that made me honestly that that was developing i was trying to feel some safety that's what the rigidity was doing for me and so i think that um kind of confused me that felt very one-ish um but a lot of other things did not fit like i'm like there are so many things about ones that i'm like bless their hearts but it's just not me and i am a profoundly deep feeler i'm highly sensitive empathic. Um, and so there were just not to say that ones aren't, but there were just many things that just didn't make sense. Um, and then I had taken a couple of inventory or I took an inventory. I forget which one. And I came out extremely high as a four, like really high. <laughs> and that got me thinking like, well, maybe I'm on this, like, maybe I was right that I, you know, I'm not a one. And I start, I just I sort of just stayed with that, like got more curious. Um, but the, a lot of the fours I knew, or at least what I thought a four was, looked different than what I felt like I am. Um, you know, I'm artistic, but I think I'm artistic in a certain way. I'm creative, but I'm sort of creative in a certain way. And it confused me. And But the thing that really, before I even understood subtypes, the thing that stood out for me was understanding um, where fours go in health versus in stress. That that clarified something for me because part of my story um, was I learned to really suppress my needs. I learned to not speak up. I learned um, to sort of uh, essentially over accommodate people to navigate difficult and really for me incorporated into trauma in my childhood. And so what I realized is that as four goes, go to two in that stress place, something about that just really connected because I began to realize that when I was in a place of health and integration, I could really connect to sort of that principled 
grounded, clear element that feels very one-ish. Um, and when I was in a place of stress, I really connected to sort of leaving myself and losing that connection with who I really am and what I believe. And, um, and that was the clincher for me that helped me realize like, oh, this makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then as I began to get more curious, I had a, a friend um, share with me more about the subtypes and, um, and, and the self-pres for when I learned about that, it was like, Fire. That was the thing. <laughs> it was yeah. fire. I mm -hmm. love to hear about people having these wonderful epiphanies and moments where they go, oh, I just heard the other shoe drop. There it is. That's the, that's the, now do you use the Enneagram at all in your work? I Man, I know a lot of your work is trauma focused and I want to, mm -hmm. you know, land on that. And by the way, we both did the counseling program at Denver Seminary. So we have that in common. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't, I didn't realize that. And I think we have um, our friend, Michael Cusick, I oh. think is a mutual friend. He always speaks so highly of you. And one of, one of my um, closest. That's awesome. Yeah. He's great. Um, but yeah, I do. I do. I, I haven't written about it formally, but I definitely integrate it in my therapeutic work. Um, Cause I think it has a lot of overlap with trauma work with oh, yeah. parts work, whether you want to call that internal family systems mm -hmm. or just even ego state work. Um, I think anything that helps us, you know, get some clarity. And, and I think people, there are different fits for different people. That's what I find, you know, in my work, I try to have as many tools as I can to say the person is the person. How can I meet you in your journey with, with, the resources I have. And I certainly don't know everything, um, but that allows me to better attune to the person I'm working with when I have different strategies. Um, and so some of my clients really connect with the Enneagram and there are a couple of people who just really don't. And yeah. so it just, it depends. Okay. I wanted to circle back on something about trauma because people ask me all the time, and you're going to answer the question, I hope. How does trauma affect your Enneagram type? Have you, have you thought about that at all? I have. I have. I mean, I think there's probably, you might get different answers from different people. Um, I think to me, what it means is that I have had to be incredibly dynamic in how I survived my life, like some parts of my life. And I think how that relates to the Enneagram is that um, our, so first of all, our bodies are freaking amazing. <laughs> and the ways we learn to adapt are phenomenal. And, and, and I say that not to praise trauma at all, because I never, um, I don't praise trauma, but what I do feel profound just respect for is the ways that God gave us the ability to get through difficulty to survive. And so I think for me, the way that trauma feels like it intersects is that I have, there are other numbers that I also really um, resonate with. Like I at times can have some really strong eight energy um, which feels like a paradox when you also go to two and stress, right? Like that is complex. Um, I think, you know, I think a lot of my seven energy got really suppressed, um, in my childhood in terms of just the playfulness, the ability to just really enjoy, um, which my husband's actually a seven, which is a, a fun dynamic and is a really, in many ways, a healing dynamic for me because I'm, mm. listen, I could get deep with someone in like two minutes. <laughs> like it doesn't, it doesn't take a lot. Um, and so I think for me, that's one of the biggest things. And then I guess the other piece of that would be to say, when you've experienced a lot of trauma, when you've experienced, when, when trauma has shaped the narrative of who you are, I think it's harder to have a sense of that true self. Like, what does it feel like when I'm really myself? And I think folks who've experienced more of like a good enough parenting situation, they've had enough safety 
and, and, and attunement typically to where it will be easier for them to know like, oh, this is what it feels like when I'm really in that true self connection space. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I think, I mean, it's really taken into my adulthood to be able to experience like, oh, this is what it feels like when I'm really at ease. This is what it feels like when it's not about a trauma response. It's not about pleasing someone. It's like just living into the truth of who I am. Mm. Yeah, you know, I love what you you uh, just you just said about the uh, you know the whole idea of how it shapes the narrative of who we are. You know, and 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 also like I I do have a you know. Personality is such a complicated topic, right? Personality theory, personality development, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but I do think that in some ways our type in part is uh, a response to very early, if not first episodes of trauma, right? Like your personality is a response <laughs> to how did you accommodate? How did, what kinds of accommodations did you have to make to get your needs met? In the, in the face of trauma, right? <laughs> so, oh, do I need to be, uh, you know, a four that, or one? You know, it's like, it's like, now some of that may be genetic and inborn, but some of it is just unconscious decisions that little people make, you know, yes. in, in order to get needs met. And so this is oftentimes why I tell people, look, you are not your Enneagram type. <laughs> like your, your Enneagram type is a persona Right. It's a it's a bit of a mask designed to protect you, uh, to uh, prevent you from uh, experiencing greater or more trauma. It's it's a way to be in the world where it's the likelihood of your getting your needs met is is greater. That's right. right. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I can see where, um, you know, you you. Uh, I can see how my, I, I grew up with complex trauma with a father who was an alcoholic and a drug addict. And so, you know, growing up in that chaos for my entire life, you know, until he died when I was in my late twenties, um, you know, uh, I can see where part of it was, I was a creative, sensitive artist, but at the same time, you know, this is how I made sense of myself in the world. Right. <laughs> and in fact, you know, in my new book, The Story of You, which we won't talk about on this show, but just as a reference point, I really think that our personality isn't uh, necessarily just a psychological feature or framework as much as it is. It's a story. Mm-hmm. It's the story we tell ourselves about who we are and how we think the world works mm-hmm. based on a child's view of the world, mm-hmm. which is why they don't work in adulthood. <laughs> Totally. Yeah. And that story, you know, just to bring in a little bit of this is really polyvagal theory. um, But Deb Dana, who's I don't know if you're familiar with her work, but she talks about how story follows state. Mm -hmm. And what she means by that is our autonomic state helps to dictate the story that we tell. And then the story a lot of times stays with us. Right. But if like, let's say you're a child and you're always And you're always hyper aroused because you're in, you're constantly afraid or then that, you know, it finally gets to be too much. And then you'd start to dissociate and that's your whole life too much, not enough, too much, not enough. What's the story that's born out of that. Mm -hmm. Right. And so these things, I mean, I'm so grateful for the, what we've come, the, the strides we've made and understanding how all these things fit together. Um, because it, it it really is possible to do the work, like, and I think exactly what you're saying that um, we can write new stories. Yes, we can reimagine. Yes. We can be with ourselves differently. What has been true doesn't have to be true in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it gives us. I think for me, often I know for so many folks I work with, I know in my own journey. It's been really important to have some understanding of why, why am I, why does my body react to this type of person in this way? Why is this thing that should maybe be easy, I'm putting that in quotes, 
not easy for me. You know, why can other people experience this type of connection in a way that feels like, oh, that's effortless. And for me, I'm like, oh no, like that's going to take a couple years of trauma therapy <laughs> so that I have the internal resources to do that. Right. And so when we have that insight at minimum, God willing, that gives us compassion mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to be able to attend, you know, and I think that's what, I think that's what the Enneagram does too, you know, to be able to say, okay, you make sense. Mm-hmm. You make sense. Like this is your story. This is the context you lived in. And of course you did that. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And that's what I get so excited about these days is saying to people, look, your Enneagram type is a story that you told yourself as a little person. And it's, you know, we become the stories we tell. That's just a fact, right? We, we become the narrative we tell ourselves about who we are. And, you know, if the story helps you survive childhood, but then screws you in adulthood, because you can't live in a children's story as an adult and expect life to go great. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It's like, totally. you, know, you, and then you do have this ability then to reauthor, to re, to rewrite the narrative. And most people don't know that they don't know they have permission. Mm-hmm. They think, oh my gosh, no, these were the cards. This is what was dealt. Yeah. This is what I'm stuck with. There's no way out. And it's like, no. And here's the deal. You can't change unless you change the story. Mm-hmm. There's just, you can make little adjustments. You can tweak some behaviors or thought patterns. You can do CBT, you know, like mm-hmm. cognitive behavior work and understand, and it'll help, but it doesn't get to the root of the problem, which is a broken story about mm-hmm. who you are and, and the assumptions you have about what the world rewards, what the world punishes, what the, mm-hmm. you know, uh, what the world wants you to be. And it's like, I think in therapy, so much of what we try to do is to borrow an, uh, a quote from uh, outside myself, which is trying to figure out who was I before the world got its hands on me. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, who <laughs> was I? And then, you know, are we ever going to capture it perfectly? How would we know? No, but we, we go mm-hmm. in search of that lost self that, <laughs> or that self that was split off from us and all then you know all the accommodations and the changes that led us to become a a false self not in the negative sense it's not a pejorative term but a provisional self a self that wasn't true to who we are but we had to become to survive does yes. that make sense oh yeah and i i'm with you and i think i think these things um are vital for us i mean i love that you're talking about this. And I think it's just such a huge part of, you know, even this season we are in the world, like um, that we begin to reimagine how do we move forward? You Mm -hmm. know? And I think there's the both, there's the, there's like the particular and then there's the expansive, like it's partly doing it in our own lives and it's partly doing it um, collectively and, and having the ability to do that. It, it matters so much. And I think, I know for me, part of what has allowed me to feel the freedom to imagine that new story has so much been this idea of really coming alongside my younger selves. Mm -hmm. And and I really say that selves. I mean, there, there are multiple, you know, there's because in complex trauma, it's messy. It's not one thing. There's so Mm -hmm. many things. Um, And it's, and I love, I love the work around, I'm sure you're probably familiar with like Kristen Neff, um, Mm -hmm. her work around self-compassion and just, I love the paradox of the resilience that's born as we attend and listen to those parts of ourselves that they want to, they they want to believe there's a new story, but they're like stuck. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, oh, it feels too unsafe to believe that this might be true, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and it's been such an honor. Um, People sometimes I feel like don't always know what to do with me when I talk about this, but I really, I talk about this in my own story. Like it is an honor to reparent the younger parts of myself Mm -hmm. who didn't get what they needed, who were doing their very best. I mean, they were given everything they had (laughs) and, and it and it helped me survive. But as in, in adulthood, it kept me really stuck. Anthony, my friend. Ian. 
Now, you know that sticking to a workout routine can get kind of boring, right, when you do the same thing over and over again. Oh, Ian, keeping my workouts interesting is a key component for me sticking to my goals. All right, so for me, you know, I like to stick to a routine, right? Mm -hmm. But guess what? It is so much easier to stay motivated when I change up what I do during the week. Mm. And that's why I love Peloton. Now, you know I have a Peloton bike on my second floor, right? Yeah, absolutely. And do I use it? Yes, you do. I definitely do. I love it. Peloton has so many new and exciting classes to explore on their app, the Peloton app. And with my busy schedule, it's been so helpful to be able to mix things up depending, you know, like on what my energy level is that day. Like if I know I have a day full of interviews, it's easy to open up the Peloton app and do a quick 15 minute cardio session to get energized for the day. Oh man, that sounds great. And did you know they even have monthly challenges to keep you motivated? Ooh, I like that. Mm, this month, I completed the strength challenge. And if my broken knee at the moment <laughs> cooperates, I'm going to get back to running so I can plan on joining the April running challenge. Ooh. Or maybe I'll stick with the activity challenge. You simply track your progress within the app. Okay, and where can folks check out all these challenges? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Just visit OnePeloton.com to learn more. That's O-N-E-P-E-L-O-T-O-N.com. So we're gonna, I'm going to get, get you into the book, Try Softer, a fresh approach to, to move us out of anxiety, stress, and survival mode and into a life of connection and joy. I love how publishing companies insist on longer titles on the cover than the actual <laughs> word count inside the book. However... <laughs> Let's j jump in. You've got 10 stories with me in an elevator. You've only got 10 floors. That's probably, you know, 38 seconds or whatever to tell me what is the book ultimately about. Ready? I just pushed the button. Go. <laughs> hey, wow. Okay. You know, this is about um, learning to pay compassionate attention to ourselves in a world that teaches us to push harder through everything. Mm-hmm. I love that. That's yeah, beautiful. Keep going. You got six floors. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so really, I mean, this is about learning to listen to our wounds and our stories. And the paradox is in doing that, it allows our body to integrate and move towards wholeness in ways that we just can't do when we're living in a trauma response. It's, it's actually biologically impossible. Right. And so that's the paradox of this book. And you go into neurobiology, you go into all kinds of like, you know, body-based work. I'm sure Bessa van der Kark has been, you know, influential in your work, you know, among others, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So let me pose to you a question that people have asked me a million times, Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, Ian, what if I had a really happy childhood? You know, like, I just don't think I have any trauma. You know, mm -hmm. I just really feel like uh, I'm, you know, I just, when you talk to me about wounds, I just, I really can't dredge up anything that sounds as, or you know, I get this, nothing as traumatic as your childhood, Ian. You know, I can't figure <laughs> out, and you know what I mean? And, and I'm always <laughs> like... I look at people all the time and I go, okay, this sounds like reality resistance disorder to me. <laughs> yeah. However, does everybody have trauma or not? You know, so here's what I would say is that I think everyone, and I don't have the statistics in front of me, but through the course of someone's life, they will probably be in an experience that will expose them to something that has the potential to become something like PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would just say beyond that, most people have experiences that have the potential to become uh, little T trauma, which essentially is in the book. I just talk about it through the lens of anything that's disturbing <laughs> that we don't feel through. I mean, that's that's little T trauma. I mean, we could go into the details of that, but it's it's essentially if it's feels stuck, if it feels like it's not finished, 
that's probably not finished. And mm. there's something there to do some work around. Um, and so what I would say is, is that most people have, in my experience, have at least some little T trauma. Not everyone will experience big T trauma. So like PTSD, because maybe they have different resources. Like maybe afterwards they had everything they needed for their body to complete the cycle that it, it needs in order for it to not become trauma. Right. And in, in that sense, that that's probably, for example, uh, parents who attended to them following the event, uh, teachers, uh, you know, extended family counselors that just help them to process and integrate a traumatic experience. For example, you know, watching a, a best friend be hit by a car, right? That's in right. third grade. But you were immediately surrounded without a lapse in time by people that listened, cared, reassured you, attended to your needs in that moment so that it didn't become something that was stuck, but that you passed through. Does that sound right? Yes, absolutely. And I think this is a, a big, um, there's not, even though trauma is becoming more normalized to talk about in our culture, I think there's a disconnect on this, that just because you go through a, an experience that has the potential to become traumatic doesn't necessarily mean that it will. It's what happens after that has a really big impact on the extent to which that will stay stuck in your body. And so that's why what happens after difficulty really matters. Right. But it's also why for folks who've had um, what I would say not good enough parenting, um, when you don't have the support you need in childhood, whether that's neglect, abuse, addiction, adverse childhood experiences, all of those things when you don't, because kiddos don't have a fully formed brain and their nervous system is not able to regulate through especially really overwhelming experiences, things that might not be traumatic to an adult have the potential to become um, highly traumatic to kiddos, especially if they don't get the support they need. And so I guess going back to that original question, um, we live in an imperfect world. There's a lot of pain. There's, I mean, we are going through a very highly um, traumatic time. I mean, there's a lot of hard things happening in our world right now. And I think the reality is we're exposed to that. But different people have different innate resilience. They have different um, um, external resources and external support and internal support. All of those things are hugely impactful um, in terms of how much something will ultimately affect someone. Okay, so I'm assuming that when you title a book, Try Softer, <laughs> right, that what I'm hearing, uh, you know, I'm assuming that what you're saying or alluding to is there's a paradox. Our default is to say, try harder. But the paradox is, is that the way forward is to try softer, which I guess contains like the premise of self-compassion, among other things. What does try softer mean? Like, you know, because I don't think it's something that people are like, no, I got to, you know, what does that mean? Totally. Yeah. So what I tend to essentially use it simultaneously with is the term compassionate attention. And so I, I've come to pair those ideas because for me, um, this is all about, it essentially depends. <laughs> Meaning like in some situations, um, like it's not a cookie cutter approach. It's about learning to be with yourself with, in a compassionate way so that we can say, okay, in this situation, I need to pull back. In this situation, you know what? Like, I, I really feel like I need to follow through and complete this all the way if I, if I can stay within my capacity. Mm -hmm. um, in this situation, I'm noticing this is what's coming up in my body. And so because that's coming up in my body, I'm going to ask myself, what is it I need to be able to move through it or to feel it? Or what kind of support would I need in order to do that? And so compassionate attention is sort of um, the vehicle. It's the vehicle that says um, the answer isn't to the answer to every question isn't to try harder. And I think in our culture, that's actually what we're typically like. That's what we're told. <laughs> like, it doesn't matter the question. That's the answer. And so for me, 
you know, I grew up and, and I'm like, I'm the poster child for this. Like I grew up white knuckling through everything. It didn't matter if I was tired or hungry or um, felt overwhelmed or felt unsafe. I said to my body, sorry, <laughs> you got to do it. Doesn't matter. And I brought that with me into adulthood because I thought that was the only way to be. I didn't really know it was even possible to be different. Mm -hmm. And it didn't feel safe to be different. Um, And so it really took time in like my own therapy, having safe people around me. And, you know, in the book, um, I had this phenomenal therapy supervisor Um, His name was John. And this was really, I was probably, I'd only been a therapist for about a year and I had done some of my own work, but it was still pretty early. And so I'm talking to him one day in supervision and I'm I'm talking to him about a client and I'm feeling overwhelmed because I think I'm not doing enough. And John looks at me and he, and he's just so compassionate and really calm and super grounded. And he says, Andy, I'm wondering What would it be like in this situation if instead of trying so hard, if you tried softer? And honestly, like that hit me like it was like it hit me like a ton of bricks because that's just not, first of all, what I really expected him to say. I thought I'm like, give me a tool. Give me like a checklist, Do you know, like. And at first, um, I laughed because I was a little bit irritated too. <laughs> like I was like, "Sure, John, just try softer. Everything right. that sounds so easy." <laughs> <laughs> um, and it took me probably, I mean, but it just stayed with me. It planted this seed, and it really began to help me create this framework of this compassionate attention. Like, what would that mean? What would I need? What would that even look like to live a try softer life? Mm. Um, and so that, that moment though, was really impactful for me because John was really kind and he wasn't condescending. He felt really safe and him saying it to me in that moment was able to help me shift something that had never, ever felt safe to shift before. Mm. And it, it changed the trajectory of my life. Mm. Wow. That's beautiful. I, I love that. So let's talk about a little bit more about you as an Enneagram 4. Uh, because I'm curious to know, is as you look back on the narrative you crafted as a little person in the face of complex trauma, and for those of you listening and you aren't sure, what's the difference between little T trauma, big T trauma, complex trauma, you know? As I understand it, and Andy, you can certainly correct me, but, you know, complex trauma, which in some ways is harder to treat than based on a singular event, mm-hmm. uh, trauma, but you, you know, it's the kind, I call it the Chinese water torture uh, trauma, because it's the drip, drip, mm-hmm. drip. Mm-hmm. It's sort of the you know, if you grow up, for example, in, an, in a, uh, an addicted household, it's the day after day after day mm-hmm. after day experiences. And they can be small, they can be large, but they are unrelenting. And they yeah. go on for a long period of time. And in the aggregate, that whole experience uh, is capital T trauma. Because even though you mm-hmm. can't push you can't point and go that was the moment it's like no i was mugged a million times yeah. not once it was a thousand little muggings yeah does that does that capture maybe complex yeah trauma? no i think i think that's a great description and and i yeah i think it's the chronicity it's the un it's like it's typically unresolved always and un, you know it's like all the experience that there's never closure, there's never yeah. co-regulation, there's never a return to safety. Yeah. Um, for me, the little T trauma, I had like, like it's, it's hard. Even when I talk about little T trauma, I don't want people to minimize what I mean when I say little T trauma, um, because I think similar to what you're saying with like complex trauma is that um, these experiences add up. Mm-hmm. And when they add up to a certain extent, they can act on our body in the same way as a big T PTSD trauma. And so if you're listening, I just want you to know that really I, I utilize that term really more as an on-ramp 
to help people understand that things that they may not have thought previously could be traumatic can be traumatic if our body experiences it that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and so I just think that's such an important thing, but I really love that um, word picture that you're using because it is just that unrelenting. And oftentimes there's no sense of what people sometimes say, I want to get back to normal. When you've experienced complex trauma in childhood, um, there is nothing to go back to. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes that's the only normal you've ever known, which is why a lot of people don't even know the extent to which they've right. been traumatized because right. that's just there every day. Yeah. It's the fish water trope, right? It's like, you've been in the water so long, you don't even know there's that the water, the, the water of trauma is all around you. You know, Anthony, one of the lessons I've learned is that not everybody benefits from a traditional 50 minute therapy hour, or even from the typical weekly sessions. And that's why some people, even though they may have a great therapist, can go to couples therapy or personal counseling for months or even years and never really get anywhere or make any progress. And that's why I am such a fan of the intensive counseling process at Restoring the Soul in Colorado. Restoring the Soul was created by my friend of 30 years, Anthony, Michael Cusick. And what does Mike do? He helps couples or individuals experience deep change in half-day blocks over one or two weeks. So Michael and his extraordinary team of counselors he has developed and trained over the years know that sometimes you can't wait months or years to get to the bottom of an issue or to experience breakthrough. So for nearly 20 years, they've helped couples and individuals transform their relationships and their lives. So if you are looking to get out of the rut you're in, but you can't wait months or years, call Restoring the Soul today for a free consultation with Michael's staff. Call 303-932-9777. That's 303-932-9777. And learn how their intensive counseling process can jumpstart your journey or launch you to a whole new place. And as a special bonus just for Typology listeners, make sure to visit www.restoringthesoul.com slash typology to download their PDF called Five Ways Unaddressed Trauma May Be Derailing Your Relationship. You've been mentioning the body a lot. I think people get confused. And in, in, in being careful not to use technical language, you know, like we can talk about the autonomic, uh, this, that, the limbic system, you know, these are terms that not everyone's familiar with. So in as simple a way as you can, as though you're talking to me like I'm a 10 year old, which is probably a wise way to approach me. Um, how <laughs> would you, how would you sort of, when you talk about the body and trauma, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is something I'm actually really passionate about because I believe it's like giving people keys to their own car. Like I think for, if you identify in any way as a trauma survivor, I think having some really basic understandings of our nervous system is profoundly empowering. Okay. Um, let's go. Yeah, let's do this. Okay. So the main thing that I talk about um, to start is that there's this range of arousal. And what that means is there's this range where we can feel our feelings or have an experience and we can tolerate it. And that range is called the window of tolerance. Mm -hmm. So once our body goes out of that window, we typically will go up into either fight or flight or sometimes fawning. And that is a response to danger. Our body does that as a way to say like, oh man, I got to protect you. So when we're doing this, anytime we go outside of that window, what's happening is part of our brain, the, the highest part of our brain that helps us with our sort of executive functionings and lots of those types of things, it goes offline. It's not available anymore. So once we go outside of our window, what we're saying is, is that your full brain is no longer accessible to you. And with the window of tolerance, typically we go first up into fight or flight, or we then, if that's too much, if our body can't resolve the threat, we go down into dissociation. 
Which means, so that people know it's a technical yes, term. Yes. Yep. So dissociation is essentially like a way of our body disconnecting. Mm-hmm. It's a way that we feel numb or we might feel um, we're not fully present. And so it's this way, it's this way that our body is trying to say, this feels way too big. And so the best thing I can do is sort of turn down the volume as much as possible. And so with that one, you know, there's a range of how bad a dissociative experience could be, but it could be even like fuzz. You could feel fuzzy or a little bit out of it. You could feel um, even just heavy or depressed all the way to losing consciousness. And so there's a pretty big, you know, I'm giving, we could give a lot more nuance to this, but this is like a real basic overview. So when we talk about trauma, what we're saying is, that this experience that you've had, your nervous system went outside of its window of tolerance and you never had the support or resources to fully process it so that it's sort of stored like all your other memories. Mm -hmm. And because that's true, anytime something reminds you of that experience, it could be a smell, it could be someone's look or like their expression, it could be color. I mean, there's lots of different things um, that will potentially um, trigger your body to say, oh, it's happening again. And that trigger is what's sending you outside of your window, therefore into either that fight or flight or down into that dissociation. And so, This is really important because if you had experiences like of complex trauma, lots of unresolved little T trauma, big T trauma, or any type of combination, what's actually happening is that your, that window gets smaller. It gets more narrow. And because it's more narrow, what that means is your body is on red alert all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you're more apt to be going into this this fight response, or not just fight, but a protective response. And so part of what we're saying is that you often may not have access to your full brain. And when we don't have access to our full brain, it's hard for us to connect with people Mm-hmm. It's hard for us to assess situations accurately. We're, you know, from Enneagram language, we're really going to have a hard time connecting with our true self mm-hmm. because that's really available to us when that full brain is online. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting. You're talking about this because Anthony and I had a conversation earlier today and I won't go into the details of it because I was doing therapy with him. But I, I <laughs> you know, one of the things that I grew up with was a lot of violence in my home physical violence, emotional violence, sexual violence. And uh, one of the things where my, I actually dissociate during when conflict emerges, my first thought is this is going to end really badly Mm -hmm. and bad things are going to happen. Right. It could be like just someone saying to me, man, I'm really angry with you about X. And I'm, I literally, I can't even form sentences like my brain starts to go feeling like hide under the couch. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like get in the closet, you know, put your knees to your chest and wait Mm -hmm. until this passes, you know? And it's like, you know, a lot of times I can, you know, I just have this assumption that, you know, of, you know, and I can deal with little conflicts. I don't want to make it sound like I'm completely neurotic. But if thing, if people start raising their voices, or people's body language starts to look like it's aggressive in a in a, mm-hmm. in a disagreement, I get like, whoa! I don't I don't know how to like stand my ground because I'm mm-hmm. like, I got flight mode takes over, right? Mm-hmm. I just like, whoa! Or I go into appeasement. I go, yes, you're right, 100. percent That's my fault. And I'm so yep. sorry, even though maybe they're mad at me for blocking the trajectory of the bullet they just shot at me. <laughs> you know? Right? It's like, yeah. You know, it's like, no, no, I'm sorry that I let your bullet hit me. You know, it's like, mm. do you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? And I'm I just do. trying to give people an example of what you're saying. Like, that is an old story. And the old story is whenever people raise their voices, right. I'm going to get possibly physically hurt certainly emotionally overwhelmed or engulfed. I'm, I'm going to fall apart. Uh, I, I, won't, I won't know how to respond because that yeah. is what happened mm-hmm. in a complex daily way, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I, I just want people to realize that 
This is how old trauma appears in a person's life. And I do have to step back for myself with self-compassion and self-friendship and go, okay, and, and self-parenting in the moment. Mm -hmm. And say, yes. all right, now, listen, this is not going to end the same way. And by the way, mm -hmm. let's say it did. You've already been through the worst of this before. It's going to yes. be okay. You know, like yeah. you will get through it. And it's hard mm -hmm. to do that in the moment because sometimes that, that, that response is so reflexive mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. it's hard to cut it off at the pass. It's always mm -hmm. having to go back and go, okay, you've just hit flight mode. And it be, it's really hard to stop flight mode from kicking in because mm -hmm. it's so. Yeah, annoying. it is because our brain is actually picking up. It's there. Our, our body is really amazing at picking up cues that are not even conscious. Yes. You know, and that's how we're able to move out of the way of a car before we've even had a conscious thought. Yes. And I think the thing, first of all, thank you for sharing that experience of yours. And I think that is something that's so common, you mm -hmm. know, that, and it, and it's, and it's living truly the story lives in our body. The story is held in the body. And I think one of the hopeful things about the work I do is that we can, we can expand that window. Right. So just like I was saying that, you know, our window can get really narrow if you're a survivor of trauma or if you've got a lot of unresolved trauma as we attend and and, you know, work with the trauma and neutralize and integrate and gain more resources and gain more safety. Those things, not that it's like flipping a switch, because usually it I mean, it, it rarely is. But I think it's so hopeful that our bodies can heal, that we can move through trauma, that our bodies um, really are designed to move through pain. And when we have what we need, when we have the support, um, when we have even what you were mentioning, I think of those like resources, self-compassion, self-parenting, safe people, orienting ourselves to the present, like, no, I am an, I am an adult now. And I love what you said. Like for me, that's actually something I say, like I've already seen the pit of hell. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> you know, like yeah. I've already seen that and this is where I'm at now. And that orients me mm -hmm. to say, so what's true now? What's mm -hmm. available to me now? Yes. Um, and I think, I think that it's like, we can honor how hard that is because that is hard work mm -hmm. and it's possible to be able to heal some of that too. Yeah. So you mentioned Kristen Neff earlier. And, and for those of you who don't know, last name is N-E-F-F -F, and she's uh, an academic. Uh, she is sort of the foremost, you know, voice pioneer on the whole topic of self-compassion, the, 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 which is not a woo-woo term. You know, unfortunately, it's been a little hijacked by kind of you know, sometimes a little bit simplistic self-help language, you know, like just love yourself. It's like, okay, well, that's true. But self-compassion, <laughs> there's a little bit of a science to it that needs you yeah. know, to be respected and like how it works and et cetera. But I think people are wondering, well, okay, how do I actually practice self-compassion in a deep way? Not in this sort of like, I don't know, stupid meme way, you know, like, like what does really deep self-compassion work look like? Mm -hmm. Well, so a couple of things to mention with her. And I, I um, just really appreciate Kristen Neff because I love that she's done the research around. I mean, you know, we can talk about it anecdotally and I think that is helpful, but it's always helpful when we can put some research around an idea and see why, mm -hmm. like, here's, measurably like why it's helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but so she talks about that there are three components of self-compassion. And I think it's helpful to know, to hear this, that um, the first one is mindfulness. And so mindfulness is that idea. You, you can only be mindful. Like when we talk again about like our, that top of our brain, our prefrontal cortex has to be online. And what that means is we have to be in that window of tolerance to be mindful. So essentially, if you can think about thinking, you can be mindful. And mm -hmm. so that's one component of it. The second one is common humanity. And with common humanity, it's like, I'm not like there, like all of us suffer. There is 
There are other people who've been through difficult things. There's other people who've been through pain. Um, and, I, and I think for me, sometimes from a faith perspective, I think about that, like through, like there's a great cloud of witnesses. Like we are, like we're not alone. And even that God is with us, you know, like that there's a sense of, of how important that is. Um, and then the third one is self-kindness. And I think that's what people usually think of with self-compassion, right? And the self-kindness is really like, okay, what would I, how would I treat a friend? Like, what would it be like to be gentle with myself? But I appreciate that she brings in all three of those elements because if we lean, like any one of those can help us get into self-compassion. But once we're in self-compassion, we actually need all three. And so to, to answer that question, how do we do, how do we do that in a deep way? I think one is, you know, if this is a concept that's hard for you, <laughs> I would say the first thing is to not go for the gold, <laughs> like immediately, like don't expect yourself to be like the most gentle person ever. If you have like a really, really strong inner critic and expect that doing one exercise is going to shift that. Part of this might be changing the expectations, like what would it be like to just begin to be like non-judgmental and just be curious, right? So that might be accessing it through that mindfulness and to be able to say like, you know, I'm going to start with this situation that is maybe not my deepest shame. Maybe I'm going to start with like the time I forgot to give my daughter the thing that she needed for her Valentine's Day class, <laughs> Right. And like, I'm feeling like a little bit hard. I think to titrate in is actually, and what I mean by titrate is we're kind of easing in to the idea of um, practicing it in a way that is not your deepest trauma. And so with this one simple one, and folks may have heard this before, but a really simple way to start this would be to just say, okay, for example, if my daughter whom I have a lot of love and compassion for, like if she um, made a mistake and she comes to me and says, mom, I am feeling, um, you know, I'm just, I'm so mad at myself and I'm so sad. If I were to just picture how I feel towards my daughter in that moment, I might notice like, what does my body feel like? Like my shoulders are soft. Um, my heart I feel like my heart feels lit up towards her. I feel a sense of compassion. And then I might practice saying, okay, what would it be like to place myself in my, that position of my daughter and to say, okay, Andy, I see you. I see that you made a mistake today. And, and could I direct that energy towards my, that I was giving to my daughter? Could I shift it just a little bit? to this mistake that I made towards myself today. Yeah. And I think for ones and for fours, we all have inner critics, but you know, I, I think for ones and fours who typically really struggle with inner critics, this is a really valuable thing. Mm -hmm. I want to recommend, I think it was on Invisible Brain, the podcast is a wonderful interview with Kristen Neff. That's fantastic. It's NPR's Invisible Brain. Also, um, the, uh, Again, and you know, I self-identify as you know a person more in the Christian tradition, but that doesn't mean we can't learn from others. And and so oftentimes, I think the people who talk best about this uh, really are the Buddhists in the Western psychological tradition. Uh, Pema Chodron, Jack Kornfield, uh, Sharon mm -hmm. Salzberg is a huge one. She's and, wonderful. She's yeah. wonderful. And again, you know, I'm not, you know, maybe some Christians get nervous that I recommend, you know, hey, listen, go outside the tradition because truth is truth no matter where you find it. And, you know, use your critical brain to leave out those things that don't seem continuous what you believe, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There could be a lot here for you. And I don't know anybody mm -hmm. actually who teaches uh, compassion better than the Buddhists do, actually. And the practices you're talking about, for example, I do think, this is just for me, uh, but I think obviously there is legitimate research, John Kabat-Zinn, other people that could help people understand this, that a regular mindfulness practice can sharpen your ability to step back from yourself and observe yourself mm -hmm. with real self-compassion. Unfortunately, our tradition has lost its connection to that kind of meditation, though it is in our tradition, it seemed mm -hmm. to have gotten lost somewhere around the Reformation. Uh, and, and I think um, 
the the second component you had what was it we had mindfulness the second one was common humanity common humanity right so i like i'm always telling people like i hate it when people go you know of course i don't know what you're feeling right now and i'm going that doesn't help me because the truth <laughs> of the matter is i want you to say to me oh yeah i grew up in an alcoholic home i know exactly what you feel <laughs> I know precisely what you feel. It feels like this. Yes, it feels like that because there is a common humanity. It's like I want to I want to be comforted in the knowledge that 10 people within a square mile of my house grew up in similar situations mm -hmm. and understand how right. I feel. They do know how I feel. And mm -hmm. as a four, this is really big to break out of the myth that my suffering is special. Mm. It may be unique. And how do mm -hmm. I break free of my addiction to the suffering and not make it into something monolithic to the point that I can never break free of its enormity? And mm. then, and then the final thing you said was, what do we have? Uh, um, kindness, self kindness, self kindness. Self -kindness. And you know, mm -hmm. I frankly think Christians are pretty sucky at self kindness. And, and, <laughs> Me and, too. Right? It's like it's pretty ridiculous. Like I don't get it. I just don't get it. And and I think you know, it's like I get, you get this in church, Anthony. I hear this all the time, and it drives me bananas. It's why I go to an Episcopal church where people just say, let's go to the Eucharist and shut up. Uh -huh. It's just like, you know, they, they say to you, it's all about grace. But the subtext is always, but try harder. Right. You know Ooh, what I mean? Yes. And I'm like, Ooh. man, mm -hmm. you didn't even have to say try harder, but it's everywhere in the room. Yeah. It just mm -hmm. smells in the room. Yeah. And it's like mm -hmm. such a contradiction in terms. And, and people need to realize that self-compassion and self-kindness does not lead, to, by being soft on yourself, doesn't mean that you're going to fall into moral licentiousness, right. that you just gave yourself <laughs> permission to do more bad things. It's like, actually, if you want to get over doing bad things, be kinder to yourself. Yeah, that's, right. that's the paradox. Well, and that's what I think is so cool, actually, in the work that, you know, some of what I've seen is that, um, I mean, really, there is a strong connection between self-compassion and resilience. Mm -hmm. um, self-compassion self helps us inhibit that stress response, right? So when I'm talking about going out of that window, part of what can help us build that, expand the window is when we have self-compassion, what we're doing is instead of that body immediately shooting out and having all the adrenaline and all the cortisol, it, it tampers that down. It down regulates it. And in doing that, what we're essentially doing is being able to feel those feelings. Mm -hmm. We're moving it through. Yeah. And that's the whole point. Like if you want people to be resilient, this is the nuts and bolts. Yeah. This is what it looks yeah. like. You know, Anthony, you know who this is great for? About 50 sevens that I know. <laughs> Enneagram sevens, the yeah. enthusiasts who have such a fear of pain and distress, who are always, not always, but frequently uh, operating in selective memory syndrome, right. right? The past, you know, it's like they only remember the happy stuff and they're so afraid of working through the feelings of the painful stuff. And, <laughs> you know, and just helping them move through this and understanding self-compassion, understanding trauma resolution, being mm -hmm. able to work through this with, with some other people and knowing I can survive this. That's right. Not only can I survive this, I can expand the window of tolerance yeah. so mm -hmm. that I can make room for my suffering. Mm -hmm. uh, and rather than being this sort of monochromatic joy bomb yep. that, that can't go there, you know, yes. just can't go there. Mm -hmm. I think other types have to be careful with this work. You know, ones have to be careful that they don't think, okay, I got to do this work perfectly because that's right. actually using the damage of the trauma to deal with the trauma. Yeah. Right. That's it's right. Like, it's a weird strategy, but there you go. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think twos would be thinking about, well, how do I help you with your trauma? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, and I could go through, you know, other types. An eight might say, no, this is, uh, you know, this, this conversation sounds like weakness and vulnerability to me. And that's what I've spent a lot of my life avoiding yeah. and hiding from myself and others. And do you see where I'm going, Absolutely, right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, sure. And, and so anyway, I, we go through all these types and see, you know, the five retreats into the mind, you know, and then, you, you know, sometimes you try to do trauma work or do therapy with a five. And what ends up happening is the five begins to intellectualize the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now they're and fives have such a hard time staying in their body 
And so they're always like a little bit when they're unhealthy, like a brain on a stick. Mm -hmm. And so they're just divorced from the body and they're just a, like a walking mind. Yeah. You yeah. know, and the six might feel a little bit like, uh, you know, the, the, I think trauma work with the six uh, is difficult in some ways because the six's response to trauma has been, has, has really been uh, like, as you know, I like to say, it's more like pre-traumatic stress disorder. It's like, I'm always getting ready. I'm always getting ready. I'm always getting mm -hmm. ready. And, it's the hypervigilance. Yeah. You know, hypervigilance mm -hmm. and on and on and on. Right. Mm -hmm. So every type needs to learn about this work through the lens of their own personality, I think, mm -hmm. and recognize how does my personality, how could it help me? And also how has it, how is it a response to trauma and how is it perpetuating the ongoing mm -hmm. trauma in its unresolved state? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. That was a fun thing to say. <laughs> All of that. A little long winded, but it, it seemed like it preached well. Yeah. Anyway, on the, the, uh, the thing I want everybody to know, obviously, is I want them to know all about this amazing book of yours uh, and workbook, by the way, mm -hmm. which is really, really helpful. Try Softer, a fresh approach to move us out of anxiety, stress, and survival mode and into a life of connection and joy. Andy Colbert, Enneagram 4 with a three-wing self-preservation through and through. What I've come away with today is uh, a sense of, I, I'm leaving this conversation with, with hopefulness and a sense of uh, even admiration for my own resilience uh, mm. over the years mm. and uh, just uh, excited for other people to begin the the process of of doing this work i need to have you on mm. one of our town halls anthony yeah and talk great. about oh, talk about that. the rewriting of narratives and how trauma mm. yes. affects the writing of the story yeah and then mm. how do we rewrite the new narrative and part of that is going to be how do we work through the trauma of the old narrative so what ian's mm. talking about for you on the end for our listeners is we have what's called a typology institute membership and Every month we actually do what's called a town hall and we mm. have lots of people come on and we do Q and a based upon an earlier podcast we did that month. Mm -hmm. um, so it's mm -hmm. a really rich time. That would be fantastic. It's kind of group therapy on. and a wonderful, it but it's really not yeah. that it's really awesome. Kind of, it's like a circle. It's almost like a, a wisdom circle with 75 mm. or yeah. people usually something like that. Yeah. Uh, and it's a really beautiful little community where we're, beginning to share very vulnerably about our lives mm -hmm. with each other. And, you know, obviously there's a lot of Enneagram talk, but we cover a lot of ground. And oh, yeah. so let's, can we get, did you write that down? Yeah. I would love to do that with you. How cool would that be? Did that'd you just awesome. write that yeah. down somewhere no, and make it. sure that we, yeah. uh, that we do that. Cause then, you know, Andy, we can yeah. talk about your book some more on the, on the, on the, <laughs> on that. I'd love it, that. No, but I think this is just a great, I, it's just such a needed conversation. You know, these, these conversations really matter. And I'm so grateful that you're creating these spaces to have mm, them. Thank you so much. Anthony, Yeah. how do people find out about how to be part of the uh, Typology Institute membership community? All they need to do is go to typologyinstitute.com. T-Y-P-O-L-O-G-Y institute.com. Nice. All right, Andy, <laughs> uh, people find out about you where again? Yeah, you can check me out at my website, ondicolber.com. And I actually have some free videos that take people through um, a lot of the work that we're talking about here. It's about an hour of free content if you go to my website. And you can also find me um, Instagram.com slash and and Twitter.com slash So everybody, just so you know, that's A-U-N-D-I-K-O-L-B-E-R. So that yes. you don't uh, you don't put in some other thing and find yourself frustrated. So you all just got the spelling. Andy, thank you so much for being on with us. What a pleasure. What a joy. And typology friends, may you have love. May you have joy. May you have peace. May you have healing. May you have rest. Until the next time we're together. Peace. Peace.